chapter 50 tonight, Genesis chapter 50, the last chapter of the book of Genesis, and um, that doesn't guarantee that this will be our last study. Uh, We may only cover two verses tonight, but uh, it's been a wonderful time that we've all enjoyed in the book of Genesis, and I've told my my mom and uh, Saturday when Angela was speaking at the ladies meeting there, and thank you for praying for her. She spoke to about 150 ladies. And thank you for praying for me as I preached there in South Carolina Sunday morning. And um, I said, well, I, I, I don't know if I've really enjoyed more uh, doing a study uh, than I have the book of Genesis. I have really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed Revelation. I've, I did a study in about every, most of, every book, not all, but uh, I did a lot of studies from the pulpit here at the church. But I've really enjoyed the Genesis Bible study has been wonderful, and it covers so many things, the book of beginnings, and so we find ourselves at the end of the book of beginnings in chapter number 50, so let's read a few verses, and I'll share with you, Lord will, what's upon my heart, but it's good to see you tonight, I love you, and thank you for praying for us as we travel, and for all those others that have traveled and are back, and those that are on their way back. Verse number 1, the Bible says, And Joseph fell upon his father's face, and he wept upon him. And he kissed him, and Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And forty days were fulfilled for him, for so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die. In my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thy bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father according as he made thee swear. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to have, Lord, the copy of your written Word. Lord, many of us have multitudes of copies in our home, in our car, at our jobs. Lord, we thank you for the written Word of God. We thank you, Lord, that it's infallible, it's inerrant. We thank you for the privilege that we have to be here to study the first book of the 66 books of your precious word. Thank you, Lord, for the way you've helped us, Lord, in all these studies. Thank you for the many times where we felt your presence, the times that we've wept, the times that we've thought and considered and meditated upon our own heart, our own life as we looked upon the lives of Abraham and of Isaac and Ishmael, or as we looked upon the life of Jacob and Esau and and now Joseph, we thank you, Lord, for these men of God, uh, Lord, that we have studied in these chapters of these uh, 50 chapters of Genesis. Lord, and then there's others, Lord, that we studied that were not godly men, uh, that were not godly women. And so, Lord, we also can take valuable spiritual lessons some life lessons from these characters in the book of Genesis. Yes, so, Lord, now as we, uh, Lord, uh, Lord, try to end this Bible study in Genesis, I pray that you would speak through me tonight. I pray that you'd help, Lord, those that are working with our teens and our children. What a privilege they are honored to have tonight. Lord, right. those that are still out of town, those that are working, those that are sick, I pray that in Christ's name you'll touch them, you'll protect them, and we'll thank you and praise you because you're worthy of all praise. In Jesus' name, amen Amen. and amen. Now, I want to just uh, back up to last Wednesday night and just touch on the latter part of chapter 49 just to refresh your memory so that since chapter number 50 is a continuation of chapter 49, and just remind you of how that there are three deathbed scenes in in the previous chapters uh, concerning Jacob. 
And uh, we know that Jacob, his first deathbed scene that we have the biblical record of, is when, is when Jacob is speaking to his, own, his uh, one son, Joseph. Then we know, second of all, he speaks to Joseph. Then he speaks to Joseph's two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. And then the last uh, deathbed scene here is when Jacob calls all twelve of his sons. And there he divides the inheritance. And there he prophesies uh, their, their people's or their children's future. Now, the Bible says that at the end of chapter number 49, after God had given Jacob the strength to prophesy, to bless, and to divide the inheritance, the Bible says that he said to them, reminded them, I, I want you to remember, bury me. I've asked Joseph to do this, and he, he swore that he would. I want you to bury me uh, there in the cave that my grandfather Abraham had bought from the Hittite, Ephraim. He said, and there is my grandfather, my grandmother's buried, Abraham and Sarah. He said, my, my, my father Isaac uh, and my mother uh, Rebecca are buried there also. And that's where I buried my first wife Leah, and that's where I want to be buried. You remember that Rachel... Uh, the wife that he loved more than any of his uh, four wives, uh, Bella, Zippa, uh, uh, Leah, and Rachel. Uh, Rachel died there outside of Bethlehem, giving birth to Benjamin. So she's buried there in outside uh, Benjamin, uh, outside of Bethlehem. And so uh, he reminds them of his 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 funeral plans, where he wants to be buried. Gets these things in order, and the Bible says that. Uh, in verse 33 of chapter 49, And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. Now I want, to, I want you to notice this, that the Bible says there that he yielded up the ghost, which simply means that his soul was released from the prison of his stricken body, his age body, and then it says, notice that last part, he was gathered unto his people. Now in chapter 50, the first, the first few verses of chapter 50, we're going to read about Jacob's body being buried. And so when it says he was gathered unto his people, it's not talking about him being buried in a family grave. It's talking about him being taken to paradise. Amen. He was gathered unto his people. And uh, what a real blessing that is, that Jacob entered into paradise, and there he once again saw his father Isaac, his mother uh, Rebecca, his grandfather Abraham, his grandmother Sarah, and he's gathered unto his people. And I thought about the word his, his, his people. Uh, there's only two types of people when it comes to death. There are God's people and there are Satan's people. Jesus said to the lost, he said, your father is the devil. And that's very hard pill to swallow, but it's Bible. And I just want to ask you, who are your people? Is it God? Will you be gathered to God's people or will you be gathered with Satan's people? People. You'll either go to heaven or you'll go to hell. And so he was gathered into his people. I want to say that my people are God's people. Amen. That's my people. God's. Now the devil's people used to be my people. For almost 25 years they were my people. But uh, since November uh, of, of, of 1996, uh, God's people have been my people not because of my good works, but because of God's grace. Amen. And so what a wonderful picture there to end the chapter that what's more important, yes, chapter 50 is going to deal with his body being buried or his, his body and his bones so forth. But what's more important is the soul. God mentions the soul of Jacob first before he even gives any scripture for Jacob's body. That's a wonderful thought tonight. 
So often men and women put the emphasis on the body. Come on, you can help me tonight, can't you? They do. God puts it on the soul. And he says there, what's important, what's important, you ought to take care of your body. You ought to baby your body. Please, please swipe on some deodorant once in a while. Squirt on some perfume or cologne. Amen. Brush them teeth first. Amen. But I'm telling you, what's more important is your soul. And some people care more about taking care of their outer than they do their inner. And it is the inner that you and I are going to have to stand before God with. And it is the inner that will be eternal, even in heaven or in hell. If this in heaven, we have eternal life. For those that go to hell, they have eternal death. They will forever die. You say, Preacher, that's hard to believe somebody can forever die. It's just as impossible for someone to, for God to allow somebody to forever die as it is for God to allow somebody to forever live. God can do both. And we have eternal life. We will forever live. But in hell, people will forever die. And so that's wonderful fault. He was gathered unto his people. Boom. Notice what it, when, the, when was he gathered immediately after he what, yielded up the ghost. There, there wasn't a day or two of resting in a grave. There, there wasn't this struggle of Satan and God over his, over his body, over his soul. He had already made his plans before he breathed his last breath. And as soon as he yielded up the ghost, he was gathered to his people. So I'm saying to you tonight, as soon as you and I give up the ghost, we breathe our last breath, we're going to be gathered immediately unto our people. Now, what, whoever your people is, that's your choice. It's either going to be Satan's crowd in hell or it's going to be God's crowd in heaven. Amen? I think that's a wonderful thought tonight. Now, verse number 1 of chapter number 50. Verse number 1 of chapter number 50 here. The Bible says that Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. You can just imagine if we all, we all have uh, had to say, Farewell to someone that we love. It could have been a husband, a wife, a mom, a dad, a daughter, a son, a grandma, a grandfather, a niece or nephew, an aunt or uncle. Somebody that we so dearly, someone that you thought was like a sister or a brother to you. And so we understand Joseph's heart being broken in verse 1. I mean, his father breathes his last breath. Immediately he's in paradise. Uh, do you understand paradise? I don't want to get ahead of you. Paradise, and we call today folks, when they talk about paradise, they talk about heaven. In the Old Testament days, folks did not go to the heaven that God went to prepare for us. They went to paradise. You remember Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus died, and in Abraham's bosom he was comforted. That Abraham bosom does not mean that he snuggled like a bug in a rug in Abraham's side. It means a place of rest, and he was in paradise. The rich man said, let Lazarus come and tip his finger in some water and cool my tongue. And Abraham said, he can't do it. Why? There's a great guff fixed between us and you. And, and before the Lord died and took his blood up to heaven to the mercy seat for God to accept for salvation. Before that, when... Folks died before the death. They went to paradise. And there in paradise, they waited for the crucifixion of the Messiah and his resurrection. And, 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 and I don't want to get too deep into that. We'll talk about that later when we get in the epistles. But that's where it's speaking of. He is now in paradise here. He's gathered into his people. All right. Now, <clears throat> notice, you said, Preacher, why couldn't they go to heaven? How do you go to heaven? Through what? Jesus, his blood. Jesus hadn't shed his blood yet. If they went to heaven, how did they go? Some other way besides his blood. There's only one way. It's Jesus' blood, period. I know it's a, folks don't like the blood anymore. I don't care what they don't like. 
I stay still. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. All right. So the blood had to be shed. Amen. All right. They, he said, Preacher, how were they saved then? They were saved the same way we are saved. We're saved by faith. We look back to Calvary. And by faith, we believe Jesus was born of a virgin. We believe that Jesus did live a sinless life. We believe Jesus was a, a lamb without spot and blemish and that Jesus did die on a cross for our sins and that three days later Jesus did arise from the grave. We believe that by faith. Well, they believe by faith. We look back to that event. They look towards the event. You remember the Bible says Abraham, in the book of Hebrews, he was looking for a city, not of this world, built by man's hands, but built by God, a heavenly city. That is his faith. They were looking beyond, beyond. They're looking beyond Canaan land. They're looking for the Messiah. And it was by faith, by faith. And that's how we all are saved, by faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Okay, let's go on. Now, I, I want to say this about verse number 1. Because it's, it's got to do with emotions. Uh, I think, was it last Sunday, not two Sundays ago, I preached and I was emotional and well, how many people know what's wrong with me? I thought, can I be emotional? Can I cry? Can I have a broken heart? I mean, everybody has things that bother them, right? I mean, everybody thinks the preacher shouldn't cry. Something's wrong with the preacher. Listen, I, I got red blood in my veins. Things break my heart. Uh, things are burdening me. I, I, I go to bed. Uh, I, even in my own bed, me and my wife can't be alone. The church goes to bed with me and my wife every night. It's always there in my mind. It's always there. I can't get away from that. That's what a real pastor does. And so when your heart is burdened or broken about uh, someone in the church or people in the church or the world, the condition is sin, or whatever it is, you know, we get emotional. But it, we need to get emotional about the right things. Right. And Joseph got emotional. He got emotional. The Bible says that he wept. He fell and he wept and he kissed. Those are three indicators of a very emotional scene. When I was studying this, looking over it again today, I, I, I had a flashback of when my grandfather passed away, and that's exactly what I did. I, when I saw him, I fell over on him, I wept on him, and I kissed him. Those were the three things I did to my grandfather Benton when I, when I went into that uh, room to see that his soul has already been separated from his body. It's emotions. I believe nothing is more troubling, nothing is more heartbreaking in our life, in our world, than physical separation. Amen. Let's start with smaller issues and work our way up to the grander issue. When I talk about, think about this. You having a physical ailment, I don't believe, I'll say me, okay, and you can agree or not or think about it. To me, for me to have a cancer, for me to have a heart condition, for me to have some health condition, that pain is not as painful as physical separation from people that I love. But let's, let's say my wife goes for two weeks. She goes off for two weeks. That is, that is only two weeks. It may be only one week. It may be just overnight. But it is physical separation. You know, you may men say, thank God I got the house to myself. But after a while, you're thinking, Lord God, when you're coming home, baby. Right? Yes. You women might say, praise God. and, and, and <laughs> no, I better just go on. I can hear laughter already. I ain't going to convince some of you. But uh, me and my wife, as far as I know, she has the same feeling. But uh, I'm like, man, I miss you. Come on back home. And, and, and I believe likewise with me gone. That physical separation is a pain. wonder if it... You know, what, what, let's go a step farther. What about it, your own child being abducted? That is physical separation. That's a pain. I mean, can you imagine how it would feel to, to, to be looking in a Walmart for your boy or your girl or your grandchild and you think he's around the corner and everywhere you go you never see him and the next thing you know this, this nightmare you have is becoming real? 
And next thing you know, the police is there. You're filling a report out. And now you've got the miss, missing people uh, filling their reports out. And all of a sudden, the news is showing up everywhere. And it gets bigger. I tell you, that's a horrible feeling. You know how it feels whenever you, you think they're gone and then five minutes later you find them? I tell you, that, that's, that's something that will make you sick. Why? There's no pain like physical separation. But the most tragic of all physical separations, okay, is death. There's nothing more painful for humans than death. Painful, physical. When you have to be physically separated from somebody that you loved and they've loved you, that is real pain. Real pain. Real pain. The death of Jacob was no doubt even harder on Joseph because for many years they didn't have a life together, did they? For many years, Joseph and Jacob didn't have father and son time. Why? Because of the sin of his brothers when they sold him to Egypt. For years, Joseph didn't see his father. You remember how it worked the first 17 years, Jacob and Joseph together. And then there's that span there where Joseph and Jacob don't see each other. And finally, the last 17 years, they spend together. Right. What is that? 34 years that they got to spend together. Whoa. And now, how heart-wrenching this must have been for Joseph. He finally got his father back here in Egypt. He's spending time with him, but now Jacob... Is, you know, death is never convenient. Can I have some help tonight? Death is never convenient. You just don't get that chance sometimes to say, I love you. You don't get that chance. To, I'm telling you, death is cruel. But at the same time, death is lovely. So, preacher, what do you mean? My son was asking me, do I believe in the death angel? And I said, I said yeah, I believe in, that there's an angel of death. And uh, we got talking about it. And I said, he don't look like the Grim Reaper. I said, that's just Hollywood's version. I said, uh, I said for the Christian, he's probably one of the most beautiful angels we would ever behold. Because death is not to scare us. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? I believe death is a beautiful angel. And what's, what's his job? All his job is to usher us, take us by the hand, and usher us to the Lord. And the Lord, of course, uh, is there to welcome us in heaven. And so it's a heartbreaking story, very emotional. I mean, he is fallen, he is weeping, and he is kissing. Uh, look at the, what it says there, he wept. I, I, I'm not trying to go after you men tonight or the men that may be listening tonight or will be listening, but, you know, we we live in this age of being macho, being real men, don't ever shed tears. I think if a man doesn't shed, shed tears, he's more of a sissy than a man that does. That God knows my heart, I believe that. We are We are destroying our little boys today by telling them, suck it up, son. I better never see you shed a tear. Act like a man. Well, he's not a man, Daddy. He's a little boy. Someone once said, the greatest gift, listen to me, the greatest gift God ever gave suffering, hurting people is tears. Amen. The greatest gift God ever gave suffering people is tears. Do you know What would it be like if you couldn't somehow explode out with tears. You keep it all in all the time. Oh, my. Thank God for tears. Tears, you say, I don't think much on tears, preacher. Well, you're not much of a godly man because the Bible says that God loves the tears of his people. He loves them so much that instead of letting them drown in the soil, he bottles them up in heaven. I'm telling you, we, we better be careful teaching our kids. Not Now, I know there are certain things. I understand that. I'm not stupid tonight that they don't need to cry over. But I'm telling you, 
I mean, if they get hurt, they're going to cry. That's, that, that helps them to get some relief. And I'm telling you, being un- unemotional in the sense of not shedding tears is not a sign of how hard a man's skin is, but rather it's a sign of how hard a man's heart is. When I see a man that don't cry, I don't think, boy, they're tough. They've got a hard skin. No, I think they've got a hard heart. Something's not right there. You need to cry. Now, you might not want to cry in public, man, but you go somewhere and you need to cry. And I tell you, God can put us in places where we'll cry. I never feel inferior when I tell you about my tears. Never. I know I'm a man. And I never feel inferior to any man in here when I have to tell you that I weep. I never leave the pulpit after I've wept and think to myself, what a sissy I am. Never. Never. You know, if we teach our children, especially our boys, not to express their feelings and be emotional, how are they going to express their feelings to their wife? How are they going to express their feelings to their own children? We better be careful in telling our kids to suck it up. Man, I'll tell you what, even Joseph, what a man of God, he wept. And can I, can I tell you about the, the 100% God, 100% man? Jesus wept often. He wept often. So if you say, if you're a baby for weeping, now I know there's certain things you shouldn't cry over, but if you say a man is a baby for weeping, then you, you try to tell that to the Lord. Is he not our example? Men, Jesus wept. Jesus showed his feelings. There's nothing wrong with being emotional, but make sure your emotions don't overrule and overrun your life. Some folks are too emotional. Some folks never get over anything. And they don't want to get over it because they think that if they don't get over it, then nobody else will pity them. As long as they shed tears, as long as they talk about the difficulties in their life, then everybody's going to just give them the attention. But as soon as they quit, they feel like, oh, I'm not getting the attention anymore. So we've got to make sure our emotions are in check. The Bible says do all things in what? It starts with the M. Moderation. Emotions are not bad. They're not girly. They're not sissified. But we've got to remember that emotions need to be under control. The emotional scene of Joseph's love for his father Jacob is example for all of us to follow. Verse number 2. Verse number 2. A lot of church members don't cry over sinners anymore. They don't cry over the state of some of the members in the church being filthy in their heart away from God. It ought to break our heart. God, give our tears back. Verse number 2, And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. Now notice here, if you know anything about the history of the Egyptians, especially the ancients, you've studied about the pyramids, you've studied about the kings, how they were embalmed and mummified. But yet, Joseph did not ask for the official embalmers. This is important. He did not ask the official embalmers of Egypt to embalm his fathers. Father, he asked the physicians to do it. Now, do you know why he did that? Because those official embalmers of Egypt always had religious rituals, religious practices that they would speak and do over the body of a dead person. Why? So that the Egyptian false god, nearly 2,000 of them, would protect protect that person in the afterlife. Jacob didn't need the help of 2,000 false God because he already served the one true God. Joseph was a man of faith. Joseph said, even at the death of my father at his funeral, he said, I'm not going to have some cult, some false prophet preach my daddy's funeral. He's not even going to embalm him and do his false religious rights. I'm not going to allow it. What a great man of God Joseph was. What a great man of God. Verse number uh, uh, 3. Verse number 3. And 40 days were fulfilled for them. In other words, he had to be embalmed and he had, it was 40 days of the 
a, 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 a period, a waiting period after embalmed before he could be buried. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. The score is twenty. Three score is sixty plus ten seventy. He said, Preacher, what's the big deal with that? Do you know that uh, an ancient historian that wrote uh, right after the life of Julius Caesar, he wrote that the Egyptians always mourned for their, their kings, their pharaohs, for 72 days. That was the official mourning period, 72. They mourned for Jacob, 70. Two days less than what the nation Egypt would have mourned for their own fair. What a man Jacob must have been. What a great man Jacob must have been to these people to have such honor bestowed upon him. Look at verse number 4. And when the days of the mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I died, and in my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. Seventy days have passed. And Joseph gets one of his servants. He says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And here's the message I want you to give him. I want you to tell him that I need to bury my father. My father has, has made me swear that I'll give him a burial there in Canaan. You say, Preacher, what, why didn't Joseph go to Pharaoh? They were close. I mean, Joseph was second in command. The reason Joseph did not go to Pharaoh is because Joseph had been around a dead body. And Joseph were for so many days, I don't know the exact days, obviously it was uh, more than 70, he couldn't go into the courts of a king. You read the book of Esther, you see the same story, where a person, if they were around a dead body, they could not get in the presence of the king. So Joseph understood that, understood that and he sent a servant to say, hey, I need to go bury my father the way he's asked me to do it. All right? And verse number 5, he begins to fulfill the promise that he made. God help you and I to be true in our words. Amen. Amen. Uh, you, know, you know, we can't foresee things. You know, we can't foresee things that happens, okay? We can't do it. But, you know, you know sometimes I say, I'll see you at 4 o'clock tomorrow at Golden Corral. And then something happens the next day. And, you know, you got to... You gotta have understanding that you know they, they uh, hey they uh, wanted to uh, be there at four, but they they couldn't make it. We can't foresee, but uh, you know we need to try our best to keep our word. I mean, one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest things could be said about you and I, besides being a Christian, that after we die, someone says to us, Brother Hicks, he was a man of his word. He was a man of his word. I tell you, that's very rare today. Amen? And so Joseph is fulfilling his promise, especially to his own father, especially to his own dad, the one that brought him into this world, his own, his own seed. Now, verse number 6, the Bible says, And Pharaoh said, Go up, bury your father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father. And with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land, and all the house of Joseph, his brother and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. Can you imagine seeing this? As they leave the gates of Egypt, and there comes... Uh, the Joseph, his family, and here comes Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Dan and Asher and Gad and Naphtali, uh, Benjamin. Here they all come. Uh, they're all Issachar. Here they all go and their families. And then all along, here comes the Bible says. Uh, the Bible says the elders of the house, the elders of the land of Egypt, and here's a great company. Here come chariots. Here comes horsemen. It wasn't Jacob that was second in command of Egypt. It was Joseph. 
You say, well, they loved Joseph so much they did this for Joseph. Well, I understand that. But I believe that in the 17 years that Jacob lived in Egypt, he was a man of honor. He was a man of strong faith. And I believe because he honored people, they honored him when he died. What a great, what a great uh, uh, funeral this was. Here they all go. What a sight. Can you imagine seeing this? As they filing out of Egypt and they're heading towards Canaan, this great company. Are y'all, are they taking a king somewhere? No. The king's daughter? Pharaoh's daughter? Pharaoh's wife? No. What is this great company? What are all these chariots and horsemen? Because he was great in God's eyes. He was great in God's eyes. And what an honor was bestowed upon this man. Let's go now. We've got, we must hurry. It's 20 till. And the Bible says that they came to the threshing floor of Atid which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourn for a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning, they said this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it, the land, the threshing floor, was called Abel, Mazaram, which is beyond Jordan, and his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. The word Abel Mazaram, Mazaram means the mourning of the Egyptians. The mourning, M O U R N I N G, the mourning of the Egyptians. This man was greatly loved and respected. And the Bible says, verse 12, they did exactly what they promised their father they would do. They placed him in that cave, verse 13, that their grandfather, uh, that their great-grandfather had bought from the Hittite Ephraim. Verse 14, And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will preadventure hate us and will certainly requent us all the evils which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thou the father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the transpass of thy brother and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the transpass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. They've already had the funeral. Many days have passed. What, 70, 77 days at least has passed, maybe more by the time they traveled back to Egypt. Now they begin to think, uh-oh, Dad's not here to protect us anymore. Joseph's going to remember what we did to him when we sold him and lied about him and hated him. He's going to remember that, and Dad's gone now, and it's going to tear our family apart. It's sad that when a mom or dad passes away that a lot of times the family gets tore apart. Very sad. I was, <clears throat> we went down Friday and wanted to go a day early and spend the night there with my parents. And my two aunts, my dad's two sisters, Judy and Trish, came down. And they were going to spend the night there with all of us and be there for the ladies' meeting the next day. And... Um, I was so glad to see him. I hadn't seen him since the uh, funeral of my grandmother. And now that Grandpa's gone on to be with the Lord and Grandma's gone, we always had family gatherings. We'd always have Thanksgiving and Christmas, and, and they were big deals. I mean, we, we, didn't, we didn't have five or six or ten. There'd usually be about 40 to 50 of us, and we'd gather. I mean, some of the, my fondest memories as a kid is, is at Grandma Benton's house, a double-wide trailer, and she had a Christmas tree that she would stick on uh, on a cat, on a, uh, 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 some type of a dresser, and I, it probably wasn't about three, four foot tall, all it was. And you'd walk in there and see this three or four foot tall, well, three foot, about all it was, Christmas tree. And all them presents just surrounding, almost where you couldn't even see the tree. 
But Grandma always had a small Christmas tree. She never had a big one. And, um, and it was just wonderful memories. And then Grandfather passed away. And, you know, those get-togethers, they didn't come as they often did. And we, it just wasn't that way. And then Grandma passed away, you know, was it like, well, my grandmother has been with the Lord almost a year. This, this uh, November the 3rd or 4th will be a year uh, that she's been with the Lord. And it seemed like yesterday. But, but you know, I, they told me after the, the uh, ladies' day, I went to say bye to them, and they were going back to Monroe. And they said, uh, we want to do something for Thanksgiving. And I said, I wish we could. I wish we could at least just right. see each other and have a meal together and they were talking about how they hadn't seen each other brothers or sisters in in a while and I thought how sad but you know sometimes when especially when someone has a little money they leave behind it just the families just break up don't they and some reason these boys thought that was going to happen to them they thought for surely Joseph was going he's the one that's the he's the now the one that's took the inheritance uh, the birthright now he's going to He's going to get things done. He's going to put us in prison. He, he, he doesn't have to answer to his dead now. He won't dishonor his dead uh, because he was living. He wouldn't do it, but now that he's dead, he would. But Joseph wouldn't even dishonor his dead even when his father was dead. And he couldn't forget about his dad. And they said, he's going to send us to jail. He may even kill us. And, 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 and so they lied about it. I believe they lied in verse number 17. I never read, Brother Wendell, I never read here in our Bibles that Jacob ever said this to the eleven brothers. I never read that Jacob told his eleven brothers, now after I'm dead, just in case Joseph don't kill you and put you in prison because he's a, the second in command of all of Egypt, you tell him I said this. I never read this. I believe they lied about it. I believe they lied about it. And uh, and look what it, the result was in the latter part of 17. What did Joseph do? After he heard that, Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Joseph wept. I, I'm not going to finish tonight. I'm, I'm going to hit this. Joseph wept. Now, get this picture, okay? He's already spent over 77 days in mourning. He has watched his father little by little deteriorate, inch closer and closer to death's door. He's watched it. He has made a promise to his father, I will bury you in the cave along with your mother, your father, and your grandparents, and your wife Leah. And he's watched that, okay? He has spent only 34 years of his life with his father the first 17 and the last 17. And all those years in the middle, he got to spend no time with them. Jacob thought Joseph was dead. And then finally, Jacob gives up the ghost. He dies. And we see the emotional scene there, having to say farewell to the body of his father. And then after all this time, Joseph's been, he's been good to his brothers, has he not? Has he not? Remember he gave them the land of Goshen to live? It was the best fertile land for their animals? I mean, he's been extra special to them. You've you got to hear this. Extra special to his brothers. He has told them over and over, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Yes, you did wrong, but I forgive you. And after all this time, for some reason, they begin to doubt. They begin to doubt. They begin to doubt Joseph's love. They begin to doubt Joseph's care. And then they decided that they better make some lie up. And they make a lie up and say, Well, Daddy said to tell you this after he's dead. Did you, you be good to us now. You can't hurt us. Daddy says you won't bother us. And as soon as Joseph heard that, he began to shed tears down his cheek. And he began to cry. I thought about that. What made him cry? Why did he weep like that? 
I mean, I've, we've read about him weeped. He wept over Benjamin. He wept over his brothers when he made himself known to them. He's wept now over his father's passing, and now he's weeping again. What made this man cry like that? Because they said, you can't kill us. You, you. Why? I believe with all my heart that, God, we need this. He had did everything to prove that he loved them. He did everything to try to prove that he cared for them. He gave them more than they ever deserved. When Joseph came into their life, they had more than they had when Joseph was not in their life. Joseph had been good to them. Joseph had loved them. And above all things, he had forgiven them. And then they come back to him and all that love, all that care that he gave them. Here they come with all their doubts, all their questions, all their accusations. You don't love us. You really don't care for us. You really don't love us. And it caused Joseph to weep. I wonder if he thought, what else can I do? What else can I do to show you that I love you? How often you and I I told you Joseph's a picture of the Lord, didn't I? Yes, sir. Look at your life now that Jesus is in it and compare it to how it was when he wasn't. Understand he's been merciful to us. He's given us more than we could ever deserve. We should go to hell. He has proved his love to us over and over. And then top of everything else he's forgave us of all our past how we mistreated him how we denied that he even existed we have done the Lord wrong but the Lord has forgave us Amen. and then above all that he has given us the best place to live he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you to live. And we doubt him. We falsely accuse him and say, you don't care. We doubt our salvation. We start thinking, the Lord can't love somebody like me. Who can't care for me like that? No, it's almost like he doesn't do this, but the Lord could do as Joseph probably could have done. Child, what else can I do for you? What does the Lord, what else does the Lord have to do for us, for us to trust Him? What else does He have to do for us to love Him? What else does Jesus have to do for us, for us to be faithful to Him? I'll be honest with you. He don't need to do anything else for me. That he forgave me, saved me, and been there for me in the past. God, forgive me. God, forgive you. When we doubt him and we doubt his love, we doubt his care, we doubt his protection, we doubt his provision. God, please forgive us. I can just see him in heaven. Lee, what else can I do? He gave his all when he spread his arms on the cross. He showed us for God so loved. I mean, anybody's welcome in his arms. They're so wide. You know, if it was like this, there's only 
a select few that could come. But he said, whosoever. Whosoever. God's been good to us. Why don't we just trust them? Why don't we quit doubting them? Let's just trust the Lord. How sad it must have been for Joseph. How heartbreaking it must have been for him to do all that he did to prove his love, and they still doubted it. How it must break God's heart. He died for us, folks. He died for us. What else does he have to do to show us that he cares? Oh, may God help us to trust him. God help us to trust him. I thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for listening to the sermon today. We hope and pray that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says in John chapter number 14 that Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our prayer here at Open Door Baptist Church is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you, and He's more than capable and more than willing to cleanse you from unrighteousness and from your sins and make you a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The Bible says if you repent, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ and by faith believe in His death, His burial, and His resurrection for your salvation, you too can be saved. Our prayer is that you think upon this and that very soon you'll make an eternal decision to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. Thank you so much.